These sculptures are larger than life. They're nine feet tall, and if you look closely, you'll notice that the figures are elongated and the heads lean forward at you. It's because they were going to place these figures high overhead and you'd see them from below. The men portrayed here helped to found our country, but we might ask who they are and how they embody the values of the Presbyterian Church at the turn of the century. I'm the Reverend Dr. Beth Hessel. I'm the Executive Director of the Presbyterian Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Foster, the Senior Curator of American Art and Director of the Center for American Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. These sculptures were originally commissioned for an ornate office building, the Witherspoon Building, that is now on the National Register of Historic Places. It's located between 13th and Broad on Walnut Street. The building was designed by the architect Joseph N. Houston in the 1890s and named for the Reverend John Witherspoon, former president of what became the Princeton University and the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence. He was also one of the figures represented in the sculptures. My name is John Carr, and I'm an architectural conservator. My company, Materials Conservation, handled the conservation of the six sculptures. The figures were created by Alexander Sterling Calder, the Philadelphia sculptor who created the Swan Memorial Fountain in Logan Square. His father was Alexander Milne Calder. He created the sculptures on City Hall, especially William Penn. And his son was the famous mobile artist, Alexander Calder, we call him Sandy Calder. These three artists were part of a dynasty of Philadelphians who worked in all different media, stone, bronze, and many other kinds of metal. But these figures were made from terracotta, which is a type of clay. Terracotta was used because it was lightweight and stackable. You can see the seams where the parts were connected. And with this material, you could build even higher. And importantly, terracotta was fireproof. When the Witherspoon building was restored in 1961, the sculptures were taken down for safety concerns because of the weathering of the terracotta. They were afraid that bits of the sculpture were going to fall on people's heads. They took the figures down and moved them to the new Presbyterian Historical Society's building in 1967. When we were called upon to examine the sculptures, we found the expected damage, as well as the repairs that needed to be corrected. The six sculptures were carefully disassembled, component by component, and they were taken to the conservation studio for repair. So that there would be no further corrosion, and to provide structural stability, we reassembled the terracotta pieces on a titanium armature. If you follow the statues from left to right, the figures represent really deeply important leaders in the Presbyterian Church. We have Francis McCamey, John Witherspoon, John McMillan, Samuel Davies, James Caldwell, and Marcus Whitman. Francis McCamey came from Ireland, and he was a crusader for religious freedom. For example, while preaching in New York, the British magistrate there, Lord Cornberry, had him arrested because he was preaching without a license. He was brought to trial, and he was ultimately acquitted. And after that, New York enacted legislation which prevented this kind of persecution in the future. John McMillan is considered the father of Presbyterianism in Western Pennsylvania. He was a circuit riding preacher, which means he would ride from place to place where he would help start churches. And then there's Samuel Davies. He was a leading preacher in the First Great Awakening in the mid 18th century. He taught enslaved African Americans to read, believing in the liberating power of education and the ability to read the Bible for oneself. Caldwell, he was known as the fighting parson because he was a chaplain in the Continental Army and he served in the Revolutionary War. The story goes that when the Continental troops ran out of gun wadding at the Battle of Springfield in New Jersey, he passed out the Watts hymnal book. He told them to rip up those pages and use them as wadding so they could continue to fight. Next to Caldwell is Marcus Whitman. He led one of the first wagon trains along the Oregon Trail. You can identify him because his left hand is resting on a wagon wheel. He and his wife Narcissa taught members of the Cayuse Native American tribe to read and write in their native language. Now that they've been restored, I think these statues call us to learn more about the figures and who they were, as well as about the men and the women who were around them. We can ask the question, what was life like for these people in their time? In that way, the sculptures help tell a greater and a more complete story about who we are as Presbyterians and as Americans today. Mm -hmm.